Oh, praise the Lord. Let's just stand up to the Lord this morning. Let's remember uh, Brother Winston's family. He's just passed away, and some of the congregation has gone up to for the funeral. It's there at 1 o'clock today, so but keep the, the family in prayer. So, But uh, he's gone to his reward, so praise the Lord. Is there any requests before we begin this, this morning? Your little grandchildren, yes. Okay. I have an uncle that's sick in the hospital. You have an uncle sick in the hospital. And his name is Francis. Francis, and his yes. Brother and his brother Norman as well. Okay, we can do that. Let's all lift up our voice together. Mm-hmm. Heavenly Father, as we come before thy throne of grace, we thank you, Lord, that we can come before thee. And Lord, at this time, Lord, you've heard these requests, Lord. Lord, touch those that need a touch, Lord whether it be in body, soul, or spirit. Lord, we have come here to worship and praise Thee this morning, Lord, that You would have Your way. And now, Lord, we remember Thy nation, Israel, Lord, at this time. We thank You, Lord, for all the things You've done for us as leading us, Lord, to this hour. I thank You, Lord, in that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. Can we see it this morning? And Brother Paul, come lead us in the song service. It's good to see everyone out this morning. So used to going like this on my head, but Uh, number forty three in the blue book. There is coming a day when no harm.
We try uh, number 46 in the blue book. Maybe we can start with the chorus. Jesus got a hold of my life and he won't let me go. Jesus came into my heart, he came into my soul. I used to be oh so sad, but now I'm just free and I'm glad. Jesus got a hold of my life and he won't let me go. Sometimes I remember I used to be living in sin. I tried to Let's go. 
and got a hold of my life. It was pretty messy 30 years ago. He picked me up and he cleaned me up and uh, he's kept me all these years. I'm just thankful this morning for what he's done for me. Thank you, Lord. But for the blood shed on Calvary Street, but for the blood, there'd be no hope for you and me. For all my righteousness is filthy rags, and that's all. sets me free but for the blood shed on Calvary Street but for the blood there'd be no hope for you and me for all my righteousness is filled Which one? 564 in the blue book. 564. Mm -hmm. China, do you know? Me either. <laughs> Maybe you guys can start it for us. I'm not sure how it goes either. Does anybody know? No? Well, we'll move on then. That's all right. Surely been good to me. 
331 for in the blue book.
Brother Elijah, do you have a song this morning? Just suppose God search to heaven and gonna find one willing to be the supreme sacrifice that was needed.
place to get this on.
ça à Halloween, vous savez une chanson maintenant hein? Uh, Crystal, do you have a song this morning?
Once I was guilty, oh, but he set me free. Thanks, thanks, I give you thanks So blessed. 
number 90 Sing with you.
Everybody's happy this morning, content. Praise the Lord. We'll uh, change the order of service. We'll have Brother Fred. Did you have a song, Fred? No. Okay. Just checking. As you stand, change the position. This, uh, the battery dead there? Just that. Yeah, I think it's a good idea.
that better? I wonder what the Apostle Paul would have done if he didn't have a microphone like that with batteries. But in those days, they would have buildings that would echo. They knew what to do in those days, and praise the Lord. I'd just like to welcome our brothers from Congo. Uh, there's seven in the family, I believe, and uh, praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Heavenly Fathers, we come before thy throne of grace. We thank you, Lord, that we can come before thee. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done in the, for us in this hour. Lord, as we look into your word, I just pray, Lord, that you would have your way. In that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. You be seated at this time. Getting old, the bulb must be getting old. It takes a whole lot more time to warm up. I'd like to talk about watching for his coming in your day. Because down through time in the early church, they were waiting for the Lord to come. But there was not enough understanding that Jesus would not come in their day in the sense of his return for the bride of Jesus Christ. And, but it's the Apostle Paul that talks about how that there would be a great falling away first that would show a certain time. And that stood th down through all the grace age that God wanted his people to always be in ready looking for when the Lord would come. Because he warned us, he says, if you don't watch and wait, you'll be caught unaware. Okay, that's neither here nor there. And no, we're here living at the end time. And I believe God has opened things up in the last three, four years that man did not know till the time that we're living in now. No, they're not. It's not something that's going to tell us the day or the actual hour because Jesus' own words that the Father told him, he said, no man knows the day or the hour, not even the Son of Man, when that time would come. Well, if he said, no man knows the day or the hour, then why watch? But he wanted us to watch because there would be certain things that Jesus said when he walked here on earth. And not, not only Jesus, but also the, the apostles, that here at the end time, we can see more clearly the time we're living in. We know we're living at the end time because Israel became a nation in one day in 1948. But even before that, at the turn of the century, when God started moving with his spirit on Azusa Street, there became a desire and a hunger in those people in at the turn of the century. We must be getting close to the Lord's coming because we're having the same Holy Ghost experience that the early church had. But yet, from Azusa Street till now, it's been over 100 years. So there would have to be something in the Word of God over time as from Azusa Street to where we live now, certain clues God would lay in, in line in their proper season because if that's all we would ever know what they had at Azusa Street, the, the bride of Jesus Christ would be very, very few. 
people would just draw back and go back to the denominational world. But God feeds his people. Yes, we live by the word of God and truth that's bestowed to us. But what keeps you and I alive and looking and vibrant is having fresh meat in your day, in my day. And I thank God for the fresh meat in the days gone by as God had a prophet on the scene, had an apostle on the scene. But we're not living in those days anymore. It's been some 14 years since then and God has surely has something in his word that gives us a little bit more, not every detail that we would like to the Lord's coming, but at least to know a little bit more than we did yesterday. One of the major things that, yes, we all know that in 1948, Israel became a nation. But there's another scripture that goes along with that that became relevant in the last year or so. It was always there. And it's not because of intelligence, it's because the Lord drops it in. He had to use a vessel of clay to say it. And so when we arrive, and now if you want to go to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 7. I know I've said this before, and a lot of you have heard it. Because it's something that's fresh on ground now. So in that first chapter, we're going to go to verse 7. Jesus had died on the cross, had risen, and he's talking to his disciples. And they had a lot of questions for him. Because prior to him, to Jesus dying and going on the cross of Calvary, they needed the Holy Ghost to understand some of the things that they heard with their mind and their understanding while they were walking with him. But now he has gathered them together. They're there together. And the question they asked in verse 6 says, When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, restore the kingdom to Israel, that's the millennium rule that is to be restored. It was promised in Daniel and other Old and Ezekiel and other scriptures. And so they were wondering, Lord, is it, is it now? When is it going to happen? Now Jesus knew by some of the parables he spoke earlier, had it been revealed to them, they would have understood it's going to be quite a while. But they were, they only knew what God had allowed them to see and they were waiting. They were, if you want to, waiting for the Lord's coming for their day because they were asking Jesus directly. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the season which the Father has put in his own power. There's a lot in that verse that it's going to identify why they could not have it in their day and why it is, has to be out here at the end time. When Jesus told them it's not for you to know, I believe the Spirit of God was informing them that even if he told them, they first of all, they couldn't believe of some things they never could have seen that would happen in the future in the, in the history. They couldn't relate to it. They couldn't see all that it entails of restoring the kingdom. Jesus didn't want to give them to such a place. Well, it's never going to happen. He didn't ever say that. He says, it's the time and the seasons is not for you to know. And because he told them that, yet they were still in an anticipation 
when the Lord would come. So they thought they, they wouldn't know maybe in the immediate future from their day. But we know that it was going to go centuries down time that a people would know. Yes, when he said it's not for them to know, but he didn't mean by saying that to his disciples that nobody in the grace age, in the church age, would ever know. He just told them they would not know. But we would know when the times and the seasons are at. Now, when we look at that verse, why did he say times and seasons? First of all, when God uses certain terminology in the scripture, he keeps that terminology down through time. He don't change like you and I. So when it expresses, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons, then we have to go back to Genesis to see what God meant by times and seasons. And, the, and throughout the scripture, you'll find that word times in many different uh, thoughts, if you want to, in the scriptures. And we're quite familiar with the 70 weeks of Daniel. That the first half is four times, and times plural, and half of time, which is three and a half years. But we can't jump to a conclusion that the word times means years. The word times, how many went to school? Nobody? You all went to school. Okay, good. How many learned addition? One plus one is two, two plus two is four. But when it came to multiplication, what do they call it? Three times three, is nine. It's a multiplier of. Their times is used in the mathematical calculation of things. And so God uses the word time. It's a multiplier of something. And we have to look in the context what he's going to be multiplying with. And in Genesis... As you see here, 1 and 14, when God was restoring the planet, yes, four and a half billion years ago, this planet was formed. This planet did not exist, nor our sun, 13 billion years ago. Now that's a whole nother sermon, how do we get to that approach there? But... We, they can document, measure, whatever you want. Not that we trust humanity in, in their, uh, not, they're not assumptions. It's these things that they can now prove with the equipment and the, the things they have. So from four and a half billion years ago, this planet started to form and to, to come into place. When that planet came to be formed, and our sun was formed at the same time, now, I don't have to go into a astrology understanding of what took place. There was the Big Bang 13 and a half years, million years ago. Then all that matter that God created, there was no stars, nothing. It was just hydrogen gas. Over time, they accumulated together. Everything, God didn't say, I'm going to create a star over here, a planet over there. He created the laws by which matter of the natural world would work. So as in time from the 13 billion years, as you arrive to now four and a half billion years ago, these things has come through different stages as these hydrogen molecules would come together and form stars that would be a million times bigger than our sun. As they would explode, that's where all these elements that you and I have on the earth that we can measure, like gold, beryllium, all these other carbon, because in the beginning it was only hydrogen. 
So it was God's chemistry using those big stars as they exploded and as they blew out the dust. And then over time, when we arrived around the four and a half billion years ago, now as the gravity again, God's law in place, now some of this material collects together and you have a planet form and you have our sun. That's as basic, as simple as I can put it. Without going into a whole lesson into that kind of a realm. But once the planet is here, we bring in Job and Ezekiel and Isaiah. How that the sons of the morning shouted for joy when the foundation of the earth was laid. It was not laid 13.8 billion years ago. It was four and a half billion. Well, maybe. A, no, it's no sense putting the picture up because I want to get at where I'm looking at this morning. But when the, when the planet came to being, now what Satan or Lucifer's garden was precious stones. Well, precious stones was formed when the earth was a whole hot bowl of hot molded material. And as it formed in the crust and the volcanoes and the earth and the quakes and so forth, that's when the stones that were formed, and that was Lucifer's Garden of Eden, because he was dressed with all kinds of stones. It's a reflection of his beginning. So Lucifer and them were created in the time that the planet was being formed. God didn't need them before that. There was no point for them to do anything. But now as time rolls on, Lucifer sinned. We had different ice age, because why was there a different ice age? Because, like Jesus says, that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. He caused evil. God gave him more than one chance. Because there was different, uh, some say four ice age period times, some say five. Doesn't matter to me. But in the end, when it came to the time before man gets on the scene, now God judges Lucifer. And God decides to, put, to bring man. And he brings this planet to a halt by putting it in a deep freeze. What you read in Genesis chapter 1. God is giving instruction to Moses to write what happened in the beginning. When the plant, when God was restoring, remember, the earth was in darkness. It was darkness because there was ice on the surface and, and the light couldn't penetrate the earth. And so what did God have to do? All the things he's telling in Moses about those creative days, when he came time to judge the previous world, the previous uh, antiquated man that Satan had corrupted, God moved the planet away from the sun and she comes into a deep freeze. Now how far was it? From, I don't know. Or was it there? All I know it was, it was darkness upon the face of the deep. Because there's other scripture that says when God created the, the planet, he created it to bring, for, to bring forth life. So now as this planet is under a deep freeze, what really he's doing is as he's bringing the planet closer to its perfect orbit, a 360, day, day, a 360 day year, as he's moving the planet gradually, uh, ice melts. Steam, water appears, then the vapor gets separated, you see the stars, because the stars always, always existed even then. Then finally on the sixth day he brings man on the scene. All right? And there too, the things that we come across it, it's just a matter of just seeing it and then you see it's, it, it, how, how the reality of it. Adam was created on the sixth day. How long is the sixth day? According to the scripture, we see it to be about a thousand years for each of those creative days. So he took 6,000 years to restore the planet to be perfect before he put man on it. Now Adam was in the spirit world for over a thousand years because he only put him on the earth on the eighth day, didn't he? He got to see everything that God was doing when he was in the last part of it, how he's restoring the planet, 
how the animal kingdom was functioned. So when God floated them on the earth, he didn't say, now Noah, uh, not Noah, Adam, uh, here what's going on. Adam could see he was created in the spirit world over a thousand years before he was put on the earth. Now we're living, now we've come to the place where knowing what the definition of word times means. And God said, let there be light, and the firmament of heaven was divided in the day of night, and let them be for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. Now in Genesis, in the days of Adam, God didn't provide Adam a stopwatch, a clock. God used the movement of the moon, the stars, and and the sun to describe days, seasons, and also years. Because that's all man needed to know. And the first way that man after Adam as as he's as we're moving on down towards Noah's time, as man would maybe uh, communicate with one another, they didn't all live in the same place. So one came up with what's called a stick. He plants it in the ground. I'm using this as an illustration. And if you put a stick in, in the ground on a sunny day, the shadow of it goes around till you see the the length of the day. So one could say, I'll see you when the stick is about halfway at noon. He didn't have a watch. All right? So that was the earlier beginnings. But when we arrive to near the flood, man lived more than 100 years, didn't he? Methuselah was 969 years. That's nine centuries. How it, and we think we're getting old after we haven't reached one. Well, then again, man's life was longer back in those days. So, in Job, now, in Job 38 and 32, he's, God speaking to Job says, can now bring forth the Mazarus, the twelve signs of the zodiacs, what it is, in a season. Knows now the ordinance of the heavens. In other words, can you tell now he didn't want Job to be an astrologer, to use astrology to know what's going on. God is just showing to Job there's a reason why he has the stars up in heaven. And he says there's a season because when you... Uh, when the earth goes around the sun, the certain stars, so let's say when you're looking at it, say in the spring, as it goes around, it's in different position going around the year. You come back this spring, there it is again. So you can know the season by where that stars you're looking at. It was not meant to be like those things you have there. It's going to, that predicts things went not according to the star charts. That's of the devil. But now as man, and he tells Job, he says, do you know what the ordinance of the heavens? When God said he created the heavens and the earth, he created by his ordinance. And the word ordinance means laws. And what is the law? Thou shalt not kill. That, and that's not the laws he's talking about. He's talking about gravity. He's talking about centrifugal force. He's talking about fusion, magnetic, thermodynamics. All these laws in which nature behaves by, which the planets behave by. So God is the originator of those laws. And gravity. Oh, we know about gravity. Man knows about gravity. He only knows its effect. When Newton had that apple fall down on his head, well, or near his head, whatever the case may be, he discovered Gravity, the speed of it, it's just the functions of it. But what makes gravity? Because we live in a galaxy, it's called the Milky Ways, and there is a humongous star that, that has become a, a black, like black hole, 
and it keeps all these galaxies, which is 100 billion stars in one galaxy that we live in, it keeps them all flowing around. So gravity is just more than just the apple falling on your head. Man knows its effects, but he doesn't know how it is work. It behaves by God's laws or ordinance. That's as much as I want to get to there. All right. Now, when it comes to times, later on, when it was needful, God started explaining a little bit more. If you read, it's in Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. Now, I put in brackets, God is He, is, that's God. It doesn't say God in that verse. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. And He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. God changes the times. Now, in this verse, He's not talking about a year. The Roman Empire did not last a year. It lasted way a whole lot longer than one year. He sets, he allowed the Babylonian empires to be set up. The Media Persian, he dictates what, what rules and when. So God can change the time when a certain empire, like the Babylonian Empire, came to its end. He causes things on the earth. The next one steps on the scene. He sets up kings. He removes kings. God does this. So therefore times now is no longer, we're looking at it as, as a one year, as you would see in the week of Daniel concerning times and times and a half, which is three and a half years. These times means in the definition of times in those verses, when you read it, like in Daniel chapter 2, 21, it's in terms of centuries. First of all, back then, man didn't have the understanding of what's a million, a billion, a trillion. There was no, there was nothing in that order. All when they seen things, when God told them something that was a whole lot, they just said there was a myriad, a whole whole bunch. Never really explaining how much is the whole bunch. Now you can say, I can have a whole bunch of marbles, or you can have a full room full of uh, all marbles. But that don't tell you the amount. It just means you don't know the number of. So the definition of times, as we see here, it's really implying centuries. All right. Job said, the times are not hidden from God. He knows when because he's the one that controls it. God works in the times of old. In the different type of seasons and so forth. He worked in the time when the children of Israel was in, in bondage for 400 years. After they were in bondage, he, he moved. Ezekiel says, he God prophesi he prophesies of times that are far off. Isn't there a thing prophesying concerning our day in the Old Testament? And in Acts 14, 15, 16, I'm just putting a few of them in here. Who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways? in times past, in centuries past. Now we're going to deal with, not right now, but what's, it's meant in Luke 21, 24, the times of the Gentiles. Now we've read that, the times of the Gentiles. Oh yeah, we know the church is, so. it's the centuries of the Gentiles. Now Paul says, but of the times and the season, brethren, well, you need not to know, because God's going to let us know. The time and the season that, Paul, that Paul's speaking about is centuries and decades. Now when we come to the one in the scripture we're talking about this morning, and he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the season 
which the Father has put in his own power. Now we're going to look at something this morning. When Jesus said that in 33 AD, he told them, it's not for you to know the times. And by what God has dropped into our understanding, the times meant centuries. And those, the times would continually roll on centuries after century after century after century. And what would tell us when those centuries would come to a conclusion? Is there scripture for this? Yes, there is. Centuries went on from the times that he told them till 1948. Because that verse there, yes, it holds some other truth that we look at concerning, well, if you want to turn to it in Matthew 24, verse 32. He says, now learn of the parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. And here's a part here that has been dropped in too in the last five or so years or ten years. So likewise, when you see all these things, know it is near even at the doors, plural. Not singular. So if Jesus was saying to his disciples in Acts 1 and 7, it's not for you to know the time or the centuries, if you want to, but about, about what he said when he walked on earth concerning Matthew 24, 32, that generation that sees the fig tree come on ground, that generation will not pass away till everything be fulfilled. A generation is not a century. So therefore, from that point, from 1948, there would never be another hundred years to go by before the Lord would return. And if you caught it. So that's a marker, understanding that from that point, there wouldn't, because Jesus said, that generation will not pass away till I come, if you want to, I'll put it in my own words. So therefore, the fact that what he spoke in that parable, hidden in it, reveals what Acts 1 and 7 really meant. That there would be a time those centuries would end. And then from centuries being ended, decades would start to be counted by the word of God. Or seasons, if you want to. All right. I'll put the world away now. Now, when Jesus spoke... Mark wrote some things about that event. Luke wrote what he saw from it, what Jesus spoke. And Matthew wrote those things too as well. Now since we're in Matthew chapter 24, verse 32, he says, Learn of the parable of the fig tree. It says, When its branch is yet tender... Not when the bud is on the tree. The bud was on the, the tree, or the bud was, if you want to, was started in 1948. But he's talking about a branch now. But not, a, not just a branch at any old time. He's talking about the branch when it puts forth leaves. Have you ever seen a tree? that puts forth a bud 
And in a day, it's got leaves on it. The branch got to grow first, doesn't it? And then it puts leaves on it. So it takes time. He's using this as a parable. Now, I don't, yeah, there's a lot of things with a lot of message we could go into and try to bring all these points into place. But the word leaves, as it is in the book of Revelation, as it is in the book of Daniel, leaves represents people. So when it starts to put forth more leaves, fresh leaves, and since it took a revelatory scripture, when it is fulfilled, we can say that's 1948. Israel became a nation. There was only about half a million Jews when the nation was founded. And they struggle over some years till you reach 1967, the Six Day War. Now they had more land, the branch could grow and put more leaves, put more people on the land. That's why we're going to look at a couple of scriptures as well to show that 1967 is when Jesus is speaking about in this parable. He's talking about, yes, there's the branch, but he's talking about the leaves, which is not. In other words, when the branch starts, it's not the same time that the leaves are coming out, right? Israel became a nation in 48 in 1967. Now she's got more land. More Jews are coming into the land to be inhabited there. So therefore, when we put the leaves on the ground, you are now when Jerusalem shall no longer be occupied by the Gentiles, right? And what does he say in Matthew 24 as well? He says, so likewise, in the same manner, when you shall see all these things, no, it is near even to the doors. What doors is he talking about? It's the door where he's going to come, but the doors has a specific scriptural understanding to it. That at the doors, plural, what happens when Jesus does come? The Gentile door closes and the Jewish door opens. That's your two doors. Is that not what happens when the rapture takes place? The Gentile is over and, that's Je uh, and the Jews now have their prophets on the scene. I mean, it's, it's, but they was there all along, the word doors, plural. But there had to be, it's precept upon precept, a little here, a little there. For what Brother Branham brought, had it not been for the seals, we would be nowheres. Without what God dealt with Brother Jackson, we would be nowheres. But now that we have certain scriptures, that we have certain understanding, now we can make the link what door really means. So now we know that the doors is speaking about the rapture, not his physical second coming. Right? All right. Verily I say to you, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Let me go back to the other one. If we're looking at the generation of 1948, and we're talking about a generation which is to understand spiritual things, Those of understanding in 1948, that would be the ministry of Brother Jackson in that period of time, from 67 on, on down through. That ministry is but off the scene now. And that ministry there cannot be the fivefold ministry. It would have to be living it yet. There's more time that fivefold ministry is going to be doing things. 
So that's why Jesus was emphasizing when the branch goes further and puts forth leaves now, he's emphasizing 1967. That's the generation you and I are living in. And that generation will not pass away till the bride has come to her completion and the bride door is closed and the Jewish door will open. That will be at the rapture. You'll find, the, I find the one in Mark chapter 13, verse 38. Here in Mark and in Luke are two parables Jesus spoke when he walked here on earth, which has significance of understanding the last generation or the last period of time that God's going to be dealing with people here on earth concerning his bride. In Mark, if we want to turn to it, chapter 13, Starting at verse 28, Jesus is saying the same thing that he told Matthew. But he records it in this fashion. He says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves. If he meant 1948, he would have never said put, putting forth leaves. It would have been no point. Ye know the summer is near. So likewise, when ye see these things come to pass, when you start seeing this, that Israel being a nation in 1948, and it starts putting forth leaves in 1967, that's speaking to you and I because it is history. These things has taken place. When you see these things come to pass, that it is nigh even to the doors. It's close to the doors of the closing. This is the last generation. Verily I send you this generation. Not 48, but 67. Shall not pass away till all these things be done. Be done when he would coming at the door. Now here, Mark says something that Matthew never said. But is to prepare us here in the end time. He's using this, he says, But of the day of the hour, no man knoweth, no, not the angels that which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Now that he's preparing, nobody knows when, the day of the hour, only God knows that. Not even Jesus knows it. Now if Jesus was God, he would know everything, wouldn't he? But there's two minds involved. God was in His Son redeeming you and I. When we look at Jesus, we will see our Heavenly Father, but because our Heavenly Father is in Him. Now, now watch what He says in 33. Take heed. He says, it would be kind of nice if you kind of looked at it, you know. He says, take heed. Watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. And if he's, Jesus says, you are not, if you don't pray and watch, you ain't going to know that when the time is. For the Son of Man has taken a far journey. Now he's giving an illustration from the time he went up on high. The Son of Man was going to take a far journey, which is the grace age. who left his house and gave authority to his servants down through the grace age and to every man his work and commanded the porter of the watch, the Holy Ghost. Watch ye therefore. Here again he's saying, watch ye therefore. For you know not when the master of the house cometh. 
Now he's going to give a hint, not to those back there in the days of Pentecost and down through the Grace Age, but this would be meaningful when you and I, when Scripture has been fulfilled, 1948, Israel's on the, on the ground. 1967, Jerusalem no longer occupied. The leaves are on the ground. Now look what he's saying. You know not when the master of the house cometh at evening time, in the, mid, in the midnight hour, the cock crowing, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly, he finds you sleeping. Sleeping on what? On the doctrines of the apostles? Every denomination are playing with that, even people in the message. But are they watching? Because without seeing what we're speaking this morning, if they're not watching, they will be caught unaware. And their house will be broken, according to another parable in Luke chapter 12, uh, 38. Now the evening time. Luke breaks it into four periods of time. But Mark, he breaks it down in three periods of time. Well, why, why wouldn't they say the same thing? Mark picks it up for when God's starting to move on a people to get them ready for his coming. That is beginning from Azusa Street till about 1948 when God brings a prophet on the scene. So the moving of the Holy Ghost of the oil message and so forth was that's the evening time. But at midnight there was a cry made. When was the cry started? In 1948, 47, when Brother Brown started to come ministering, his first part was to restore what was lost and bring everything that was in different denomination into one place where the bride would have all the same things that the apostles had. That's your midnight hour. But in the midnight hour, Luke picks it up from 1963. Now, I don't want to get... Because when Brother Branham's ministry changed from restoring truth till you reach 1963, now becomes a change. That was restoring truth. Now it becomes divine revelation. Now the carcass God is going to be feeding divine revelation. It goes along with Revelation chapter 19 where it says that the spirit of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy is prophetic. Understanding of what Jesus is saying, when he would be saying it. And if we're following the Lord, Jesus said, follow me. He didn't mean just to the disciples when they were walking on the earth. We are to, the church was to follow him. Although he's in glory, he would send his word because what he, did he do when he walked on earth? We were to follow the words he was speaking. There, he was physically there. But he didn't have to be physically to follow him. The apostles followed Jesus by what was revealed to them. And then in this hour, he that speaketh from heaven, the shout in 1963, God had not brought no revelation new after 96 AD till 1963. And from then on, yes, as time and condition of the earth would be there, God would start revealing some things to you and I so we can know and watch when he's coming. And so we have the midnight hour. But at the end of the midnight hour, that's where the ministry of that prophet now becomes prophetic. Now I use 1963 and there are some preachers that will argue, well he did, he, he spoke about the church age before and he that was start to be brought out even before he did because Car Clarence Larkin had mentioned something but he didn't have the right man there. Uh, the 70 weeks of Daniel. The serpent seed is not new. Did Jesus not tell the Pharisees, you are your father the devil? And he said, we be not born of fornication. That was speaking about the serpent seed. Yes, that was being restored but he updated it. But when 1963 came, it was not an update. It was a fresh 
divine revolution. And God was not just going to stop with that. That's why he was bringing an apostolic ministry that would teach a, some servants that would be part of that fivefold when the time comes. Now, and time's moving on. Now, during the crock crowing hour, that's when God had an apostle on the scene for almost 40 years. And that's why the bride could not be raptured in 1963 or the seventh seal couldn't be broke. How many wonderful, beautiful revelations was opened up from 67 right up to 2004? And the bride needed every one of those revelations before that seventh seal can be broke. And the bride needs to know what's in this hour before that seventh seal is going to be broke. But when all is revealed, then Jesus will break that seventh seal. And that's up the road. Now when it comes to that ministry, that apostle ministry, we are now in this, what's called the morning time, or the time of the fivefold ministry. When I look at these things, oh, I better go back. There's something I want to bring this morning that was there, but not necessarily there all along. Let's go to Luke chapter 21 now. We're in verse 24 of Luke chapter 21. Jesus is speaking, foretelling what would happen to Jerusalem, how it would fall, not one stone left upon another, and so forth. You can bring all that in there. But when we reach verse 24, he says, concerning the Jews, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword. That was back in 69 A.D., when Titus came and took them and pushed them and fulfilled the words of Jesus concerning that temple. And the Jews would be led away captive into all the nations. That's history. If you've got computers and Google, you can Google this. Or if you're too lazy to hit a few key, you can ask, what's that thing that you talk to there? Uh... Anyway, that, the Google talk thing. Talk to it. It'll bring you the message. It doesn't give you no revelation to let you know what was history about. So he said, To be led away captive into all the nation, Jerusalem shall be trodden down. Now the word trodden is not a word that we use in our language today. It means occupied. That Jerusalem would be occupied of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's pointing to you and I right here. Right? 1967. When Israel took in the Six Day War, they became the master of the city of Jerusalem and other parts of the land. They didn't get all the land. Yes, there's Arabs still living there. But it's not the Arab that's ruling Jerusalem up to the Jordan River. It is Israel. And he says, when that happens, the time of the Gentile is over. The Gentile time is fulfilled. Well, every Gentile nation is still here. But what he says later, what Paul says, yes, we can look at it from the secular history, how the Gentiles occupied the land and so forth. Yes, in 1967, the Jews got it. But it's not strange because the time of the Gentiles, God was going to put out a people for himself, didn't he? 
And what happened during that grace age and the church ages? In the, even in the church age we're living in now. God was pulling out of those Gentiles and each one over time stopped at a certain border and, start, and didn't go no further. They became denominations. And in 1967, about that time, now don't go pinning a date somewhere, but if you can see the reality here this morning. Up to the time Brother Branham preached concerning the seals, and it was thing was not done overnight, but it would, as it would, this would go through for the next couple of years or so, till '67. God was finished dealing with denominational religion, Gentile religions, Christian, so-called Gentile religion. That was cut off. That's what's cut off. Because when Paul talks about. If that, until the Gentile is finished, well, what is Paul talking about? The fullness of the Gentiles. He's talking about new armies coming through from 67. He's talking about believers. And the fullness of the Gentile is what? The last generation. You can equate the same thing as was Jesus speaking about. The fullness of the Gentile is implying the last generation of time in which now God would bring this bride individually, bring them out, Call them out from the different denomination, not working in denomination, no more. Bringing out a people, getting them ready, feeding them. So that they could be ready to meet when he would come. That's why... The fullness of the Gentile? Yes, the third watch started in 1963. Brother Branham initiated. But in 1967, God was finished with all the denominational church. It was not some, something done overnight. Here he preaches the seals, six seals. And then bingo, as it goes out, all the churches refuse it. God says, that's it. No longer dealing with the churches. There's that transition period of time. And so from 1967 is where the fullness of the Gentiles are coming in. It is a generation. And from 1967, as we're looking at it being one generation from there on, that God is pulling out a bride to finish her. From 1967 to 2017, you have gone through five decades. We're in the periods of time of decades now. And it's in the fullness of the Gentile, which would, yes, God would start that apostolic ministry to revive, to teach a fivefold ministry that would, would, now, would come on ground, and it came on ground after 2005. And it's out of it, somewhere in the body of Christ, are going to be one day those seven men when that seventh seal is broke. So therefore, we are when we see this miraculous war, and when we talk about this miraculous war, now I know some of you have not been privileged to understand or might have not seen it before. But God gave that apostle a vision, not a dream, a vision that all these scriptures pertain to a miraculous war where Israel will get all her land back and then build her temple. But when that takes place, and without going into that whole message, what God's going to do, he's going to show how he's going to treat the different nations as and that war will be a quick war. It also in line with Isaiah 63. Have G, the God having his bloody garment by these Arabs. And he's standing in Busra. After he's dealt with those Palestinians that's in the land and those Arabs. He's going to get rid of the most, most of them because there's going to be a great slaughter. And then Israel will stand in her full land as it was promised to Abraham. To, yes, to Abraham. 
So as we arrived in that Ezekiel War, uh, sorry, the Miracle War, they build their temple. And from this war being in number of days, because God's not going to do a long war with them. He never does when he's involved. Then Ezekiel 38, 39, it's going to be also be a quick war. So you have in the rough about from the beginning of that war to Ezekiel 38, 39, about three and a half years of time. I'll, well, I'll say Brother Fred said it was three and a half years. About. Then you have the seven seals going to be broke. And that seventh seal is also going to be about three and a half years. Because when you read Ezekiel, when the war ends, it takes seven months to bury the dead. But it'll take seven years to get rid of the weapons. And in order to get rid of the weapons, you can't be at war yourself. Usually that's done in peacetime. So therefore, if you go from the middle of the week, when the Antichrist comes in and sits in that temple in the middle of the week, those Orthodox Jews are going to raise a ruckus. No Gentile sits in that temple. And according to Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6, two-thirds of that nation is slain. When he talks about the Antichrist coming in there, you put in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6 or 8, and there's two-thirds killed. So therefore, from the middle of the week, after the Jews are being put to the sword, you have that terrible time, so they will have no time to clean the weapons and clean the land. So now we have a border knowing that from the middle of the week going backwards is seven years to Ezekiel. Well, there's three and a half years for the first half. During that, while the two prophets are prophesying, the Orthodox Jews can go and clean the land. There's no war. And therefore, that would leave about the time, about three and a half years or three years, for the, that seven seal to work. What happens when that seven seal is broke? Jesus comes off the mercy seat. He sends an angel down here. He cries with his voice, the seven thunder sounds their voices. Now that message cannot be just, oh, on one Sunday everybody's going to hear everything and know everything. That's going to take seven months, maybe a year for that to be fulfilled to begin with. The voice of the archangel, that's going to be involved into something as well. And so therefore, what is Jesus doing up in glory? Why does he send an angel down here? Did he say, I want to take a break? After he broke the seventh seal? It's been so hard, I just broke the seal. I'm going to send the angel to do the work. He's busy dealing with the deceased saints in heaven because they have to appear before his judgment seat. And if there's 10 million of them, you don't do that overnight. That's why he sends the angel down here to you and I. So while the dead in Christ, Peter, Paul, James, and those are being judged individually before Jesus... We come individually for that angel that is representing Christ and God Almighty. When that's all done, and all the prayers of Revelation chapter 8 and 3, now it's not all the prayers in that seven seal time factor, it's the prayers that you find in Revelation chapter 5, around, I believe around 8 somewhere, where it talks about that the, the beasts were holding the prayers. The 24 elders were holding the prayers in their bowls. They were never offered. The only place where you see all the prayers are being offered is here when we prayed the last prayer and all the prayers of the saints from Adam is now being all offered up unto God showing a finished work because at that time there will be no more anyone having a glorified resurrected body. Because in the millennium, there isn't. Well, so we're living in this third watch. And it's sad to see 
Well, the Pentecostal wouldn't even have a chance because they, they didn't even accept what the prophet was talking about when God used him to re- open six seals. And so is the Brandon movement. The things that we see today, they do not know nor want to know because it's hid from their eyes because they have har- hardened their hearts and they don't want to see. And the same thing is happening to those that came out of the ministry of Brother Jackson as well. That's why Jesus said in in Mark, watch, because you don't know when I'm coming. And he's talking about information concerning his coming. Through the Branham movement, oh, we're okay. We're waiting for that seventh seal to be broke. and, And then we'll know everything. My foot. The Jackson movement. Oh, there's going to be a miracle war and the building a temple in secret war. We're waiting for that. That's all we need to know. My foot. There's been a whole lot been revealed since 2005. Little things here and there. They are not major things. There were not deep, dark, hidden mysteries. When centuries ended, all you had to do was look. Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. Jesus said that generation ain't going to go no further so there ain't going to be no hundred years so living here at this time with that miracle war which probably or maybe a year or two years down the road I don't know exactly when but when that happens you have ten years or left till the rapture because these things will all be fulfilled within that ten year period of time so that's why the seasons. Why we, we, we know when the season would begin? Because of Luke chapter 21, 24, the fullness of the Gentile all fits in that same period of time of these last two watches. That's the time you and I are living in. And there may be things up the road that we don't know yet that God will yet open up a little bit more nuggets to clear the picture up as we get closer to the time of our departing here. I'm getting worse. I've been an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, 10 minutes, I should say. But it's not something you can explain in in five minutes. And and if you're hearing it for the first time, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. But if you're open and search as God would allow you to see what is an on ground it's so simple it's so simple that educated preachers can't understand it if I was to ask the ministry in in the Brandon ministry or if I was going to ask the Pentecostals or the Baptists or even those after brother Jackson God has hardened their hearts and blinded their eyes because they don't want to see what's in this hour. It all boils down on an attitude. And the problem is you're not the servant that we th- that God that we see that God has chosen. It's that simple. It's not to lift anyone up. It, If it's the word of God, it should speak for itself. If there's fresh meat and we're saying we're walking in the message, then there should be some fresh meat, not just meats of day gone by. And that's wonderful, the things. If it's new to you with the things that was ministered in the days of Brother Branham and the days of Brother Jackson, that's fresh meat when you come across it the first time. But if it's been some 30, 40 years, don't tell me it's fresh meat. I'm thankful God is still feeding the bride. She lives on that carcass. Who delivers the carcass? It's the Lord himself. If the Lord is delivering these things, you can speak against the servant as much as you want. But if you speak against his word, then there's a price to pay. Are you still happy? Oh, but... Preach me a nice basic salvation message, Brother Fred, so I can feel good and know how to walk the straight and narrow way. 
When I hear something like that, I, said, I, I, I think in my mind, do you know how to read? Do you open up your Bible and talks about the things that you should do and not do? And how you should live? Does a preacher have to thump you on the head to, for, to get you in, in order? It's the Holy Ghost that will get you and I to clean our lives. Yes, there's time from time to time. There needs to be a refreshing of preaching where, where we came from, how we're saved, and what God has been doing for us. We're not living in the first church age. We're not living in the dark ages. We're living in the time where Jesus warned us. Watch and pray, for you know not the hour that he's coming. And he gave a hint in, in Mark for four places. And in, in Luke, he gets, uh, sorry. Yeah, in Mark, there's four, there's four, and in Luke, there's three. But they don't contradict one another. One starts from the 1900s. The other one starts from 1963. And when they're put in place, it's such a beautiful picture. I don't know why even beginners can understand this. But if God blinded some people, then there's nothing you and I can do. You can try to warn. You can try to present things try in a certain way for them for people to come to understanding, but if it's just an understanding from your intellectual mind, that's all it'll be. Well, okay, let's just stand. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that, Lord, we can look into your word. Lord, it's not of our doing. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for you have, Lord, gave us in this time that we're living in. Now use the words that we fit, see you see fit, Lord. Use as you will see fit. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. We'll have musicians come. If someone still has a need, we'll, we'll give you an opportunity. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Don't worry about tomorrow. He had it under control. Just trust in the Lord with all your heart, and He will carry you through. Oh, sometimes it seems so rough to keep my eyes on you when things. says to me just trust in the Lord with all your heart be not on your own understanding in all of your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight don't worry God under control. 
Just trust in the Lord with all your heart, and He will carry you through. Just trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Don't worry about tomorrow, He's got it under control. Just trust in the Lord with all your heart. Just a little longer, and the trump of God will sound. Just a little longer, and we'll all be glory bound. Hello, way to Jesus, our redemption. Let's just stand. Look to the Lord. I'm going to ask Brother Elijah to dismiss us in a word of prayer. And uh, let's remember Sister Margaret Ruff. Uh, her husband Winston had just passed away when his funeral was today. So. And the other request that was asked here this morning. All right, Brother. Lord bless each one.